Okay, so coming up next, in the nick of time, we have Mr. Marco Robinson, the founder at NKD Technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Marco. And then, a late substitution, we have the CEO and founder of Hot Now, Nitinan Bunya Watanab Yusit, coming up here. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Nitinan. The man himself, the showman. Let's find something for you. I mean, what role does uh, pricing play in the, in the process of investment assessment, in your opinion? Uh, I don't think it's got anything to do with price, it's got to do with the value. Okay, would you like to explain that a little more for everybody? Well, this space has gone so fast. And I'm 50 years old, it's gone faster than my 50 years in one day. Really? Yeah, and this is not even the first day of the crypto world we're watching. We put it in perspective. So you started off with a founder of Bitcoin, no founder, no office, no assets. Who was it? Okay? So why was that started? It was started because someone was pissed off at banks, taking all the money and not giving it back to the people that deserved it. So you have millennials now that are really holding the wallets as against that. Because yeah, you know, that's that's the revolution. So now you've got the flip side to this where now it's becoming like an ICO, it's becoming like an IPO in the sense that you're looking at the founder, you're looking at the value proposition of the product or the coin, and then you're looking at the scalability and user adoption. So, to be honest with you, I mean, I'm from the kind of like the old world, but I'm moving into the alien world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is very alien to 99% of the clients. They don't know what the hell an ICO is. A lot of people don't know what Bitcoin is. That would be interesting. I mean, how many people even in this room know what an ICO is? Does everybody in here know what an ICO is with a show of hands? God. There's a few, you see, even in this room, the people who are interested in this are still not sure. Market, market, but still, some people don't. Yeah, that's what I mean. This is a room that people are very, very interested in cryptocurrency and things, yet some are still unsure of what an ICO is. How many is. people have asked you, how do I buy Bitcoin in the last three months? I mean, the thing is with Bitcoin is people see it on Facebook or as some kind of social media platform and then suddenly they, they want in on it because they've seen that somebody else said, because it's reached 10,000, God, this is crazy, is it a ripoff, is it a scam? Right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's the opposite because blockchain is the technology that prevents all of that and makes it safe. So you've got fake media coming from a certain part of the corporate world that are going against Bitcoin and crypto and trying to regulate everything, but they don't know what's happening. They're like a deer with the headlights, they don't know how to regulate it. Yes, it goes so fast. But well, when we come down to the question, what makes a good ICO? Fundamentally, there's three things that makes a good ICO. The founder. Just here. Right? What have they done? What, what have they actually achieved? You know, what are their achievements in business? Have they actually done anything useful? Are they on social media? Do they have a sustainable, continual continuity in social media? Are they there all the time? Are they transparent? What have they done for the community? What's that founder stand for? What's the brand? What's the brand? The brand is track record. Next is the value of the coin. What do they get for the money? Simple old fashioned rules, guys. If I buy your coin, what the hell am I going to get for it? Right? And then how do I use it? Because right now, this space is very complicated for simple people to understand it. Yeah. And then lastly is the scalability. How many users are going to use it? Are they going to grow those users? Why are they going to grow? What's the mechanism that's going to make them grow to adopt that coin as their main source of value or currency to spend? That's Go, Marco. Are there any bad ICOs? It's a very broad question because it depends on a lot of variables. Um, when I came into the industry, I saw white paper with 50 people on it. So, oh my God, there's 50 people on this white paper. That must be really good. I've got six people on my white paper. Okay, so it's not a, it's all about perception, isn't it? Yeah. Now last year, like you said, it's a very different place. So last year, you were flipping ICOs. Your friend just bought this ICO. He went on the computer for eight hours to win the Civic, for example, and he made money. He flipped it. Now it's not the same area. You start the last guy off. Forget his name from Germany. Uh, we just had uh, Benjamin Bonhart on. The guy from Token Market. Uh, Total market, Pratsu Salah. So now you've got the window of raising 20 million is 
way longer than it was last year, in the space of less than a year. So now people are becoming wiser, but they still don't know what the hell an ICO is. So subjectively, there is good ICOs, there's bad ICOs, but someone might buy an ICO and flip it and make money. So is that bad? You know? So you've got a trading world and you've got a user world. Yeah. The two different worlds. Seems like you're agreeing over there. Yeah. yeah. Not in your head. We go to The reason people buy an ICOs that have never bought an IPO is because it costs pet cents. It's yeah. easy, right? So in the, in, the, in the real world, IPOs are basically dead because normal people don't even know how to buy an IPO, let alone an ICO. Why do you think SEC is going crazy? Exactly. And another thing, too, I want to point out is that for many of these tokens, they may never actually get listed on a high volume exchange. So investors may never actually see liquidity. Even low volume exchanges. Well, let's go back to the exchanges just for a second. So it's a you. Right now, we have an issue because all the exchanges are full. Yeah, they're just up. It's a month to list on Bitrex as a user. So now you've got net cost law in reverse. Right? You've got user adoption because there's too many users. But the, the, the infrastructure, the architecture, and the exchange can't grow fast enough. Yes. You've got a space where, oh my god, what's happening next? The growth is so phenomenally fast. And it's, it's, it's really who can really capture that space and grow that quickly to the market that, that wins. Do we have anybody who's wanting to ask a question out here right now? Let's have a look. Pop your hands up anywhere in the room. We've got one right in the back down there to make you walk as far as possible. If you do have any questions, write them down, get ready, because we'll be moving around the room. And obviously you can ask our panel of experts up here, like myself. So if you could just state your name, your company, and then the question, and we'll see if anybody jumps up to answer it, or we may move across. I'm Hassan from Shopping. Uh, my question is about the IPOs. And, uh, <laughs> so if a company had a successful ICO, do they need to go to IPO later? Is one question? Yeah. Should we take the first question? Have you got, have you got a copy? Here we go. Yeah, I mean, if we have the monitors a little louder on stage, that would be great. So, um, is IPO actually uh, put some constraints on the companies, regulations, and audit, etc.? We cannot get such things on a uh, company that's still in the ICO stage. So, how would this would be managed and how it would affect the future of the small companies, uh, ICO companies, and also for investors to trust these companies in the future? Thank you. Darren, you'd be like nodding away. Yeah. Like, you're yeah. to say something. Go. No. Um, I believe that a lot of ICOs, it depends on which jurisdiction they're in, they'll have to go the IPO route, if not at the beginning, uh, at later on down the road, down the line. Uh, regulations are very important when it comes to certain jurisdictions. However, if you're looking for a large increase in value on your investments, I would look at the ICO route as opposed to the IPO route. Go on, Mark, go add on. Actually, you can do both. Yeah. Uh, you can do both. But what, leading from what you were saying, you're right, an ICO is fantastic. It's probably the best way to raise capital in the world today. Far faster than you could doing it conventionally with a company by growing organically. So if you can get an ICO with the right team, the right founder, the right product, the right value, you can turn that parent company into an IPO that owns the technology of the ICO, and you can have that parent company launch a number of ICOs, which makes the total value of that entity way more than a single ICO. Is it like quadruple dipping that you're talking about? <laughs> dipping, excuse me? Double dipping is not enough. Mean, then, then I, I would never limit myself by double <laughs> dipping or any kind of thing. <laughs> right then, moving swiftly on. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, the next question. This is Saeed, uh, CEO of Bestro Capital. Actually, I have one question for the panel. The question is, I do understand this ICO is kind of a niche market right now. In the IPO, how it works is, the underwriter bank guarantees the total sale of the IPO. In ICO, how does it work? Thank you. Yatanan, would you like to answer that one? Can you have repeated the last Can we just repeat the question again for us? Thank you. 
we can go elsewhere. In an IPO market, the underwriter bank it can be an investment bank, maybe an asset manager, they guarantee the whole underwriting of the IPO. In ICO, how does it work? Does the underwriter, is any underwriter who guarantees the total sale of the investor? If somebody is coming, for example, raising $10 million, does the underwriter, do we have an underwriter on ICO who guarantees the whole subscription of this? It depends. As, as I spoke with ERC 223, um, they're self moderating this ecosystem to ensure that the next protocols that they come and put into place with the current technology that's out there, it allows that technology to hold those funds, to guarantee those funds will not go to the creators of the ICL until they hit specific milestones. Essentially guaranteeing self policing with the individual investor. Except it's not a bank. It's not a bank, but it's technology that is. It's actually way more transparent than a bank ever could be. Absolutely. Basically, the protocol is going to be written in the code, yeah. and where the code is being open short, everybody can come in and verify how the fund shall be released, what trigger point, what variable is going to be triggering the release of, of the fund that help grow the ICO or how the company has the right to use the user proceed, and accordingly to what they already have written in a white paper. For example, self-regulated. For example, when you put your money in a bank, do you know where the money is going from the bank that's your savings? No, you don't. Because the bank can margin that money by over 70 times, but they don't have to tell you where it's going. So right now it's gone the opposite way, where I've got a minute, I should know the information. So now there is another ICO where it's tracking where the savings is going from the banks. So this is really a good thing, and your question is really good, because it's triggered this answer of complete transparency in the world. The younger generation want transparency because they've seen their parents being bankrupted by conventional banks just being greedy and playing the stock market like the casino, right? Without being regulated. So in 2008, the banks basically bankrupted a lot of people, made 50 million people homeless, right? And they got bonus. They got bonus. Well, do you want to have an ex leverage in their derivative portfolio? Yeah, you know? So blockchain and crypto, blockchain really, is the tech that is completely, you know, address that solution, address the problem, sorry. Thank you very much. Hannah, do you want to add on to that? Thank you, that projects at the side. Yeah, sorry, the project, projects at the side. The, the, yeah, projects at the side, the token supply, what percentage to accord to the public, uh, you know, during their ICO. Uh, what to do about unsold tokens. Uh, do they transfer it to the, the founding team? You know, and, and have a vesting period of a, a number of years. Do they do they earn them? Um, and this is all distributed via smart contracts. So they receive investment from the public through smart contracts, and the public receives their tokens through the same smart contract. So it's it's really up to the team. You can say that developers are setting the valuation um, of of uh, the network before these tokens actually uh, hit the market. Thank you very much. Now we don't have much more time. I believe we've got another question just down here. There we go. You can stand up for us and just uh, use your name rightly. My name is Mike. I'm from, uh, I represent Wirestock, the first uh, free uh, stock image exchange built on smart contracts. Uh, I have a question to Hanok. Um, first of all, do you guys, uh, I'm curious to know what uh, stage of an ICO do you normally invest in? And if you do invest in pre-sale, what kind of uh, discount do you guys expect normally? Thank you. <laughs> wow. Uh, so I, I try to get in uh, projects that I like as, as early as possible. Um, and you know, I look to be a value add uh, in addition to just helping projects you know, meet their capital needs. Um, I've been very active in the space uh, and formed communities of influencers and uh, people that can help with community engagement and marketing. Also, developers that can um, help consult on, on white papers, um, and you know, also help review code, and you know, kind of give that developer buy-in. So, uh, with that, you know, value add, you can kind of form a strategic partnership that goes above and beyond just being an early investor. You can um, work with these partners, uh, these projects, very closely throughout their entire token sale, and even afterwards, and making introductions and you know, negotiating terms, which is. Really, just uh, you 
that it's really no best practice, I would say. It's I wish you two parties agreed to. Thank you very much. And we now need to go on to our final question, I believe. We've got, do we have one more? We've got, just here. We actually had about eight questions, but if no. I were to do them in order. It's a lady question. A lady question. If we were Jake. to do them in order, it's a joint question, it appears. <laughs> okay, here we go then. Hi, I'm a student from RIT Dubai. Uh, forks versus ICOs, what's your take? For investment. Depends on the business use case. So like, uh, forks don't come out like ICOs, like you know, we sell yeah. and everything. So what's what's the traditional strategy when it comes to forks as an investment point of view compared to ICOs? Can I just say so something on that? On that particular question, that's very subjective depending what your objective is in terms of what your returns you want and why you want to do it in the first place. So forks can be great for some people, ICOs can be great for other people. It depends on a lot of different variables. But most importantly, it's what do you want? That's my question to you. I actually, uh, I actually have a prediction that's going to happen in this market soon with uh, all the institutional, yeah, with all the institutional uh, level individuals coming into play with the ICO route. I think a lot of this ecosystem is going to go the institutional route, and then we're going to see traditional guys like myself who've been around since 2012 who want to go to the fork road, who want to go back to POW, POS. You know, we want to actually see the product done before we start to invest our time, our money, our efforts, our mining capabilities into those projects, which in turn, they, that rewards these developers to move this industry at such a faster progression than we're doing with this ICO race. Uh, it, it's why we grew so quickly in such a short period of time with such a brand new technology. And that's happening already with the, the length of time now. Yep. The racing money. Right then, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that does bring us to the time where we have to end this, but I'm sure these guys, if you're about around here, will answer any questions or maybe even have a little debate with you about it, who knows. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, if you could put your hands together for Bindanan, Marco, Darren and Kenneth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.